As we come to God's word, let's ask for his help. We surely need it, and let's thank him for his word. Father, we recognize that as a people who are rebellious, stubborn, short-tempered, resistant to change and to your will, oftentimes we, we really deserve silence from you. And yet, in your grace, you have spoken abundantly through your word. And we pray that your spirit would now take the word that is proclaimed. May he open our eyes to the wonders of it. We pray that you'll soften our hearts and open our ears to receive it. And that you will help us together as a family to grow because of it. We pray in Jesus' good name. I am the center of the universe. That statement, in a nutshell, encapsulates one of the most pervasive worldviews of our day today, and it's called individualism. And individualism is a worldview that basically says that the wants and needs of the individual take priority and are more important than the needs of a group or a community. And as, as those of us who would identify as Christians here this morning, we'll probably never express individualistic sentiment like the one I just said. I also think there are times when the more subtle, faint echoes of individualism can be heard across the lips of Christians. Things like this. The most important thing in my life is my personal relationship with Jesus. I know there are times when I can't always be with the people of God, but let me assure you that during those times, my personal devotions are always on point. And you know, if I'm being honest, the truth of the matter is that my spiritual health and what happens in my spiritual life is really something that's between me and God. Of course, our personal relationship with God does matter. We know that God saves people, individuals. But we also know that the Christian life is not isolated or autonomous. John MacArthur, to drive home the point, goes so far to say that the Bible doesn't talk about a personal relationship with Jesus. It talks about a corporate relationship with Jesus. Now, even if Dr. MacArthur is leveraging a bit of hyperbole, although who might have questioned John MacArthur, <laughs> the point is clear that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our personal interests or even our needs. It's what we're learning in this study, the gathered people, a study of the nature and the role of the church. And as Pastor Marty so helpfully pointed out last week, we're part of a family. Once God brings us into a family, what do we do from there? What should we be doing for and with each other to promote growth as a corporate unit? And so it's from that springboard that we come this week to an expression of church life that's not only helpful in combating unrestrained individualism, it's also the way that our corporate relationship with God and with one another is expressed. I'm talking, of course, about church membership. I'm sure you all saw that one coming. But in all seriousness, church membership. Now, wait a minute, you might say. Is, is church membership even in the Bible? Why would I have to join a church? And furthermore, why and how could something as formal and structured as church membership be the way that something as organic as the family of God can grow together in faithfulness? And those are fair questions. And it's with those questions ringing in our ears that we come to the scriptures this morning. Why don't you meet me in your Bibles in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, and we'll look this morning at verses 3 through 6. If you don't have a Bible, I would strongly encourage you to grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to take that one home. You'll find Romans 12 on page 948 of that pew Bible. Romans 12. And I will begin 
beginning in verse 3. Let's hear the word of the Lord. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Amen. So by way of framework, as we've done throughout this series, what I'd like to do this morning is draw out some high-level observations uh, from Romans 12, and then to bring alongside of those observations some supporting passages of Scripture that I hope will build a biblical case for church membership and to show the value and even the need for it. So three observations, the first being that church membership reflects our kingdom citizenship. I think one of the most helpful ways to better understand membership in the body is in relationship to our citizenship in the kingdom. Track with me. Look back at verse 4. We see Paul writing, as in one body, we have many members. And then he goes on, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. That is a beautiful phrase, one body in Christ, because it reflects our essential unity in the Lord Jesus. He is our our common share. He's our common hope. He's our common pursuit. But there's there's something else that we've got to consider about this phrase and, more broadly, the metaphor of the church as the body of Christ. We've also got to consider that as members of the body, we are not only united in Christ, we are also united under Christ. Jesus is the head of the church, Ephesians 4 tells us, and that idea of headship denotes authority. In fact, one of the verses that we often use for a variety of applications and contexts around here is Colossians 1.13, which says he's delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In other words, Jesus is not only the head of his body, he's also the king of a kingdom and a kingdom people. And by God's grace, we are given citizenship into that kingdom. It's a glorious, glorious thing. And as we think about that kingdom and as we think about the rule of Christ, it only makes sense that we ask, where is this kingdom? Where is it that that we can see and experience the rule of the Lord Jesus expressed? It's pretty hard to see it if we're honest in in this sin-sick world that we live in. So where is it? Well, Philippians 3 provides an answer for us. It tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. We know that that right now, King Jesus is present at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning on high. We know that the citizens of heaven are joining together, rejoicing and praising in his great name. And that's a wonderful hope. It's a glorious picture of Christ's reign. But what about those citizens of the kingdom who aren't in heaven yet, namely us. Where on earth can we find the reign of Jesus? Can we find refuge and encouragement and community, a heavenly kingdom outpost of sorts? The answer is in the church. Do you see the connection between the body and the kingdom? You see, the head of the church, King Jesus, is reigning in and over his body. So the gathering of kingdom citizens on the earth is where the word of Christ is proclaimed. The ordinances of Christ are administered. Where the care of Christ is practiced and the mission of Christ is executed. The church. It was during the Reagan administration that then Secretary of State George Shultz would give a fun little informal test to newly appointed ambassadors that would come through his office. 
they would have their conversation, and then before they left, he would say, now, before you go, I want you to, to walk over to that globe, and I want to make sure you know where your country is. He would often look a bit perplexed. It's kind of an easy question. It was quite a process to be appointed as an ambassador, but they would humor him, and they'd walk over to the globe, and they'd put their finger on the country where they were being sent. Easy enough. But when a man named Mike Mansfield was appointed to ambassador to Japan and put to the same test, he responded differently. He walked over to the globe, and he put his finger on the United States. That's my country, he said. And from that day on, Secretary of State told that story to every outgoing ambassador. He told them, never forget that you're over there in that country, but your country is still the United States. You're there to represent us and never forget you're representing the best country in the world. These are poignant words as we consider how church membership reflects kingdom citizenship. We are not talking about some social club or business cohort. We are talking about the gathering of kingdom citizens into a kingdom assembly of sorts where we are representing Christ to the world and his kingdom. I find that pretty compelling as it relates to church membership. But as I look around the room, I see the look in your eye. And it says, you got to do better than that, Drombetta. After all, we could say that every Christian across time and space is part of the body, right? And part of the kingdom. Even those who aren't formally associated with a local church. Okay? Let's dive then into our second observation from Romans 12. Church membership not only shows and points to our kingdom citizenship. It also affirms our Christian distinctions. Church membership does something really helpful by way of the practical distinctions in the Christian life. Here's what I mean. Verse 5 of Romans 12, it says, We, though many, are one body in Christ, and, Paul goes on to say, individually members one of another. But Paul is, is saying here that life in the body is not only about interconnectedness to Jesus in him and under him, and it is. It is also about an interconnectedness to one another. And that begs a huge question. Who are the one another's? Think about it more broadly. I mean, there are scores of one another's in the New Testament. Love one another. Outdo one another in showing honor. Welcome one another. Care for one another. We could go on. Who are the biblical writers talking about? It's true that in a sense we could say every Christian, generally speaking. But the application that we so often just blow right through is the one that's a whole lot closer to home. Many times the clearest and most basic application are to those in closest proximity to us, namely, other members of a local assembly. They are the one and others. And it's pretty easy, after all, to say that you love and care for all Christians everywhere. But it ain't so easy to love the person sitting next to you. Why? Because they're annoying. And, and I'm unbearable sometimes, many times, all the time. The, the, the point is that despite all of those things being true, I am your one another, and you are mine. And church membership draws a very helpful set of lines around the one another's of the Christian life. And this really is where the rubber meets the road in this whole conversation about church membership. And we, we might express it this way. Our membership in the church is expressed by our membership in a church. Our membership in the church is expressed by our membership in a church. The church of Jesus Christ is certainly broad and, and vast and reaches across time and space and geography and race and socioeconomic class, and we praise God for that. 
And inasmuch as the church is general, it is also specific. Inasmuch as the church is global, it is also local. It must be. How else then could we possibly love a particular person in a particular point of time and and space? Our membership in the church really is expressed by our membership in a church. Let me give you a couple other examples that supports this idea. One comes from 1 Corinthians 5. Here, the Apostle Paul, again, writing to a local church, says, it is reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. So let him who has done this be removed from among you. Twice there, that phrase, among you, among you. And I think the implication is clear. There are some some lines that are being drawn here. I mean, who's in and who's not in and who's in that shouldn't be in? How can this local church possibly remove this person from among them if they don't know who they are in the first place? We see a similar example in Matthew 18, a pretty familiar passage where Jesus is providing some instruction on dealing with a brother in the church who sins against another. You probably remember, he says, listen, first go to your brother and try to work it out. And if he doesn't listen, bring along a couple of others. And then in verse 17, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's code for an outsider. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now that passage gets even weightier if we think back a couple of chapters to Matthew 16, where Jesus uses similar language. Peter makes a confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus responds by saying, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and here it is, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, we don't have enough time to delve into all the complexities of the keys of the kingdom, but just two things seem to be pretty straightforward. First is that Jesus establishes the ground upon which he's going to build the entire church, namely, people who commonly confess the supreme lordship of Jesus. The second thing, though, that we see pretty clearly is that Jesus delegates a measure of kingdom authority to Peter and the apostles by giving them the keys of the kingdom, keys that are later exercised by the church at large. We saw that in Matthew 18. So what does all that mean? I think Greg Gilbert's words are pretty helpful. He says, just as a king would do for an ambassador, Jesus gave that church the right to speak with his authority. Jesus was giving his church a royal charter of authority. It alone would be his embassy on the earth. Now let me just pause and be very clear and very careful about something here. We are not talking about some kind of autocratic, papal infallibility for determining a person's salvation. We're not talking about that. We're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. At the same time, While these examples from 1 Corinthians 5 and Matthew 18 of accountability and of church discipline are not examples of determination, they are examples of affirmation. Affirmation. And that affirmation only makes sense within some type of framework that defines who is part of the church and, and who is not. And so church membership provides such a framework. Our membership in the church really is expressed by our membership in a church. Final example here from Hebrews 13. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders, he goes on to say in verse 17, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Again, we have to ask the obvious question here. Which leaders? Which leaders am I 
supposed to submit myself to? Which leaders am I supposed to obey and imitate? It's probably not pastor so-and-so down the street whose church I've never been to and who I've never had a conversation with. It's probably not that TV preacher whose theology that I don't agree with. So who is it? This is where church membership is so helpful and even necessary. It answers these types of questions with names and with faces. It helps us to know in the Christian life who belongs to who in a distinct and particular way. Reminds me of a story of a child who once became the queen of her country. And one day from an upper palace window on a beautiful sunny day, she she looked down and saw all of the people going about their daily lives. She contemplated this for a moment and eventually turned to her attendant and said, do all of these people belong to me? The wise attendant smiled, looked at her and said, in a sense, my queen, they do. But perhaps more importantly, you also belong to them. Membership in the local church is an expression of our distinct belonging. We belong to each other. And so we see that our membership in the church is not only expressed by our membership in a church, it's also experienced by our membership in a church. But the argument goes even deeper. Church membership certainly reflects our kingdom citizenship. It certainly affirms some particular and helpful distinctions. But our third observation is that church membership formalizes our corporate commitment. Membership states and it solidifies our commitment to grow together as a church family, not independent from one another, but together. Verse 6 of Romans 12 alludes to this very practically, very matter-of-factly. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then Paul rattles off a handful of examples. And in that straightforward little phrase, we are reminded that life in the body of Christ is driven by a mutual commitment, not only to Jesus, but to a particular group of people. Listen to it from Galatians 6. Again, the Apostle Paul, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's a picture of enduring commitment. To grow together in both Christian character and in Christian conduct. And again, not with a group of obscure hypothetical Christians. With a group of real people. So what might that look like on the ground? I will rattle off just a couple of examples of what this doing good might look like. Maybe marks of a healthy church member. Number one, being present. And that might sound obvious, but listening to a sermon online is not the same as being present with the family of God. Personal devotions are no substitute for corporate worship. Listen, those those are good things. We commend both of those things and more to you. But please, please don't tell me that you did church at home last weekend. Friend, I love you, but no, you didn't. Be present. Because the people around you need you to be present. And frankly, you need them. Number two, come early and stay late. I cannot tell you the amount of ministry that takes place around here before the call to worship and after the benediction. And this this rhythm, this discipline that you might build into your week is also really helpful in fighting a consumeristic approach to the church gathering, right? I come, I receive services rendered, and man, as soon as the service rendered is over, I'm out of here. So a good discipline to build in. Number three, learn to bleed a little. 
This is another way of saying, be vulnerable. You know, as soon as I say that, a few of you are ready to check out because this is terrifying for you. And probably for good reason in some cases. But I can tell you firsthand that while there are certainly risks to vulnerability, there are also great rewards as it relates to the family of God. And that requires time and intentionality and courage. Number four, give generously to support the mission of the gospel through the local church. And I would say that to you whether Old North was your church or not, because I'm convinced that in the New Testament, we see that it's local churches that are the engine to gospel ministry in the world. So give generously and sacrificially as a response of worship to God and to move the ministry of the gospel forward. We can accomplish more together in this area. Number five, actively help others grow. We said this at the outset, but in an individualistic society, whether we like it or not, we're all programmed a bit to think first and foremost about ourselves. I come here and I get filled up and I participate in church life because I need help to keep going. Those things are true, but that means we have to be intentional and active about looking outside of ourselves to not only grow ourselves, but to help others grow. This is, after all, the essence of church membership and commitment. So many ways practically that you can do this. It's hospitality month. We already talked about that. Invite someone into your home. Let them invade your space and eat your food. You might pick up a prayer connection at the Welcome Center or have a real conversation here in the Worship Center where you ask how you can pray for a brother or sister in Christ. Within your interpersonal conversations, you can do a couple of things. Number one, you can talk less about yourself and you can ask more questions about the other person. The other thing you can do in your interpersonal conversations is be intentional about pivoting the conversation from the superficial things that we often like to talk about and it's fine to talk about to the more meaningful things of life. This takes intentionality, but this is how we help others grow. Number six, fight sin together. This means we gotta know each other. We've gotta ask good questions of one another and we've gotta be willing to get our hands dirty. Actively fighting sin is putting Hebrews 3 in action. Exhort one another every day that none may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That we welcome accountability and grow simultaneously in humility. And number seven, find ways to orient the rhythms of your life around a healthy local church. Even if it isn't this one. Now I'm not just talking about the priority of participation in that sense, even though that's good. I'm talking more about a mindset here that considers how all of the other parts of your life, as important as they are, fit in and around the local church. For example, will taking this job promotion, will jumping into this hobby or leisure activity, will a tenth vacation or a seventh extracurricular for my child Will that help or will that hinder my ability to exercise a commitment to the local church? You know, honestly, I would be happy if we just even started asking that question. I see this week to week so very often that if there is ever a conflict of interest, it is almost always without fail that the local church gives way. And I wonder if we could just even re-engage in the conversation. Why should it? Those types of questions. So at this point, you might be saying, okay, I I get it. I probably should reevaluate a couple of things and think more carefully about my commitment to the local church, but I am still not sure why I need to formalize that commitment. I mean, God, it it just seems so wooden. I mean, can't I just do all of those things functionally without formally committing? Well, yes, I, I suppose you could. But I would be curious to know if that's how you approach commitment in all the other areas of your life. Your marriage, for example. What did you say when your spouse proposed to you? Did you say, you know, I appreciate the ask, but why do we need to make this so formal? Right after all, we could we could live together and share the same address and the same bank account and do all the things that married couples do pretty happily. I mean, why do we need the formal commitment? That's just going to sully the, the organic nature of love. 
No, you, you probably formalized the commitment. And the reason is because formalizing a commitment doesn't weaken the relationship. It actually strengthens the relationship. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, love needs a framework, a binding obligation to make it what it should be. A covenant relationship is not just intimate despite being legal. It is a relationship that is more intimate because it is legal. Friends, the same is true of our relationship with the local church family. Church membership is our opportunity to say, I do, to one another. In all of the mess, in all of the complication, church membership doesn't sully the organic nature of the church. I, let's just stop it with all of that. Listen, the church in the New Testament was both organic and organized. The church in the New Testament met informally and formally. They kept lists and roles and defined leadership and documented theological priorities. And don't forget, by the way, this is how God himself manages his relationship with his people. Through covenant commitments, the making and fulfilling of promises throughout the Bible. And in Jesus Christ, he fulfills those covenant commitments in ways far better than we could ever ask. And this is where we are refreshed by the good news of the gospel in this conversation. God's covenant promise to gather a people unto himself, even if it came at great cost. And it did. Paul in Acts 20 to the Ephesian elders says, pay careful attention to all the flock to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Jesus has obtained and purchased the church with his own blood. That's how committed he is to this thing. He initiates and mediates and fulfills a new covenant relationship between God and his people. He has satisfied the wrath of God against sin and opened the way to God for anyone who turns from their sin and puts their faith in him. There are no membership dues to pay, No debts or invoices because Jesus has already paid them. Think about it. I cannot just waltz into Canfield Swim Club this week or Planet Fitness or even Sam's Club for that matter without paying the fee. You want to get in? Somebody's got to pay. And in the case of the local church, someone has. Jesus paid it all, and this is the ultimate evidence of his covenant commitment to the church. And so we ask, if Jesus is so deeply committed to the church, why are we so casual in our commitment to each other? We're really going to balk at a three-week membership class? We're really going to roll in week in and week out, critiquing and consuming and maybe even contributing, but never committing. Our membership in the church really is expressed by our membership in a church. And to that end, I might call your attention to a little card that we have placed in the pew racks uh, in front of you. You might even just take it out and look at it. It says, yes, I want to make a commitment to growing in Christian maturity with the Old North family by becoming a member of the church. Listen, I understand this is a sensitive topic, and I I deeply appreciate your active listening and attentiveness this morning. It's a great blessing to me. I recognize that, that some of you have legitimate questions and concerns about this issue, Some of you are genuinely terrified to submit your testimony or to make a commitment in fear that as soon as you do, something's going to go wrong. I recognize that some of you have legitimate questions, theologically speaking, that you want to work through. And and so I don't, and we certainly don't as leaders, want to trivialize those questions or to make light of them. But we do still want to have the conversation. So so if the needle has moved for you this morning, if something has clicked, I, I would encourage you strongly to take that card, check the box, put your name and phone number or email on it, and drop it in one of the baskets as you go. I mean, I would love for nothing more than to overwhelm Pastor Rick Enlow at this fall's membership class. 
I mean, I would love to see our pastors get in a wrestling match because we need to use the bigger room for membership class. I would love for nothing more than to overwhelm our elders with membership interviews, and I think they would probably echo that. And I would love for nothing more than those of us who've already made this commitment to grow in it, to take it seriously, because it matters to Jesus. Membership in the church really does matter. And we know that our membership in the church is expressed by our membership in a church. And maybe for you this morning, maybe even this church, let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise today for the one who purchased the church with his own blood, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we think and reflect deeply on him, the level of commitment that he showed to fulfill the new covenant, that you would put your law in our hearts, that you would write your word upon our hearts, that you would, in fact, create and call a people unto yourself, that you would be our God and we would be your people, all made possible by the Lord Jesus Christ and by his work. So as we turn to the table, we give you thanks for making a way and pray that in response, we would join ourselves together and commit to growing together under Christ, we pray in his name. Amen.